Okay, so let us talk about elliptic curves. Over Q. Actually, yesterday we did part of it. So, P y square equals Q plus AX plus B. A B in our rational numbers and four A Q plus twenty seven B square is not zero. So we say prime. P is good for E if P does not divide and uh, we define the zeta function for the elliptic curve over the rational field as uh, the product over P, P good of uh, simply even 1 minus A P, P to the power minus Z plus P to the power 1 minus Z, that is right. Yeah, that is and times something else, which is a product over bad prime. So, just for the sake of completeness, let me give you what that is p product over bad primes of 1 minus a p p to the power minus z very simple but a p is not well defined for bad prime uh, and actually it's not defined in the same way for bad primes so this a p is actually without going into too much details, it is either minus 1 or 0 or plus 1, depending on what is the type of badness. So, the type of badness could be there is a repeated root, which is two roots repeat, all, all three roots repeat, right. So, depending on what kind of badness is, it is minus 1, 0 or 1. Okay. So, this is the zeta function over uh, for the elliptic curve over rationals. And like I said last time, this is closely connected with the um, with the uh, Fermat's last theorem, amongst other things, of course. So, what is the connection? So, let us start with that connection. What? It depends on the type of badness. So, when there, of course, I just had enumerated two types, right? Two roots repeat, and all three roots repeat. But within that, there are classifications. So, Fermat's last theorem is, I guess, all of you know what this is. There is no integral. x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n for n greater than or equal to 3. So, how does the proof go for this? So, I will just provide a very brief proof sketch. Assume that uh, a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n for for number integers a, b and c whose g c d is 1. So, they do not divide otherwise you can just clear out denominators and still satisfy this and n greater than equal to 6. Okay. For n less than 6 we already know the solution. So, if n equals 3, 4 and 5 one can prove using very simple method that there are no solutions. This, these were proved by Fermat himself. I think Fermat proved it for n equals 
can be proved for n equals 3 and 4, 5 are like generalizations of that technique. Okay. Now, consider This elliptic curve, which is a pretty simple and it is defined using this solution, one of this, this one solution to the form of this equation a, b, and c. So, just take a and b and you make a to the n and b to the n, so a to the n and minus b to the n be the two roots of the right hand side so apart from 0. Okay. Now, for this curve which is an elliptic curve, it is a discriminant, discriminant is same as the 4 a cube plus 27 b square and if you, you remember that that is non-zero if and only if it has no repeated roots. So, an alternative definition of discriminant in terms of roots is a, okay, so that is a discriminant of f is delta f it is uh, its product of root differences. If any two roots repeat, then the product is 0 and discriminant is 0. And it is actually easy to show that for an elliptic curve, the discriminant the definition I gave is equal in is equal to the product of different roots. So, what is the product of different roots for this curve? Well, 1 is 0 one root is 0, the other root is a to the n, the third root is minus b to the n. So, the difference between a to these two roots is a to the n, the first two roots 0 minus minus a to the n, 0 minus minus b to the n, that is b to the n and a to the n minus oh, and the third one is will be minus b to the n minus a to the n minus a to the n minus b to the n. Okay. So, this is equal to a to the n, b to the n, a to the n plus b to the n. And because a, b, c is the solution of that Fermat's equation, so a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n. So, I can write it as a, b, c to the n. a, b, c is an integer. So, this is showing that the discriminant of uh, this particular elliptic curve is nth power t f. Okay. So, what does it mean? Well, it means many things, but one of the things that it means is the following theorem that uh, if delta f. This is a more general theorem which I am specializing for the case of this elliptic curve. If delta f is lth power integer, then it has a point. This theorem is conditional. Let us keep it as it is. Since it is an nth power of an integer, so it has a point of order n. The point of order n is so the, there is a multi group associated with the, the elliptic curve, right, which is a group of rational points. This is a rational elliptic curve. And point of order L simply means a point such that, that if you add the point to itself n times, you get 0 or infinity, that is the identity of this and no smaller number of additions will give you infinity. So, that is precisely point of order. So, the power of discriminant in relates to the order of a particular point that is all. Okay. And 
then there is a theorem, another theorem that if the f is modular then so if the curve is modular which i'll define soon if the curve is modular then it does not have a point of order greater than or equal to 6 so if we can prove that f is modular whatever that means then we are done because then we say that it cannot have a point of order greater than or equal to 6 right so therefore either all points have order less than or equal to 5 or have infinite order actually you know that they can keep on adding the points and never hit infinity uh, so if it has a point of cannot have a point of order greater than or equal to 6 then the discriminant of f cannot be sixth or higher power of an integer by this theorem which means in turn that a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n there is no such solution a b c cannot exist and we have proved the theorem okay so that's a connection so this uh, whole okay part of these things were known already but this was in this connection was put together by uh, Gerard Frey in late 80s I think he proved this in 80s now I am hiding away certain details actually strictly speaking the statements I am making are not true but approximately true there are some small small twists that one has to give even the discriminant definition changes by there you have to divide it by certain power of 2 but we will not get into that because that just makes the whole thing messy without adding anything to our understanding okay so so the challenge at this point was can we prove f to be modular so what is what does it mean for a curve to be modular So let us go back to elliptic curves and let us go back to those the zeta function. So you recall zeta e z over of q if you remember last time we wrote it as also as a n by n to the z right with the with certain prop multiplicative properties of a n. Multiplicative. This came out of the product form of it, which you expanded to get this form. So, this is one series we associate with an elliptic curve. And like I said, maybe a year, couple of lectures ago, there is another series we can associate with the elliptic curve, which is the natural power series. So, let us define that to be, let us say, f e z q uh, instead of writing z to the n I am going to write slightly differently this is a Fourier series form of the power series okay we can derive it naturally from the power series by whatever the variable in power series is replace that variable by e to the 2 pi i x and then we have this fourier series form okay so these two you can see the one this coefficients are really common to these two series and therefore there is there is some relationship clearly between these two Now we have so far looked at the zeta functions. So now let us focus on this alternative form, the Fourier series form of this. Can you identify some interesting properties here? Yeah. 
there is one very simple but nice property and the name Fourier series itself gives a hint to the towards that periodicity this function f is periodic what is the period what 1 1 is any the period of this function certainly divides 1 let us say because f of z plus 1 what is that n greater than equal to 1 a n e to the 2 pi i n z plus 1 which is uh, n greater than equal to 1 a n e to the 2 pi i z times e to the 2 pi i n since n is integer e to the 2 pi i n is 1 so it is a Fourier set state. So, this is a periodic function and that is why there is any periodic function there is a natural Fourier series. So, that is one pretty obvious property of this function. There is another very uh, interesting property which is uh, see this function clearly is the way it is defined. Now, let us look at um, what should I say where is this function defined. So, this function may or may not for various points on the complex plane this function may or may not be defined. Suppose z is on the upper half of complex plane which means the real no the imaginary part is positive. So, let z be uh, alpha plus i beta and beta being greater than 0. Then what is f z? A n e to the 2 pi i n alpha plus i beta. this is no idea. So, if you look at the absolute value of z f z this is less than equal to sum over n absolute value of a n actually a n is an integer. So, it does not matter the absolute value or whatever it is a positive integer times well this goes away and this is again always positive. This is less than equal to summation n greater than equal to 1. What is the upper bound on a n? Like uh, order n. See, a p is p plus 1 plus minus 2 square root p, right. And uh, the multiplicativity property shows that a p q is a p times a q. So, this is essentially order p q. And uh, the a p square although I am not given the definition one can show is order p square. So, since this would be order n a n would be order n divided by e to the 2 pi beta this a n. This clearly converges. Right, because the denominator grows far more rapidly than numerator you just The same argument can be used to show that when you are in the lower half of complex plane then this diverges because then this would be positive and that will really shoot up no matter what your coefficients do to you. And on the real line may or may not converge depending on how these coefficients are set up. Okay. So, that is the sort of the 
the structure of the space where f is defined essentially upper half of complex space ok. Now comes uh, a interesting transformation on the upper half of complex space which is called the Mobius transformation. here h plus is upper half of complex space ok. Tau z goes to where a b c d and determinant of a b c d is 1. So, this is a well this matrices 2 by 2 matrices whose determinant is 1 they form a group right with the you know, usual identity and so on group under multiplication and this is a very well known group called the symmetric linear group uh, of type of order 2. And uh, so, essentially this S L 2 is operating on z. So, tau z is simply tau is simply S L 2 operating on a complex number in this form. The interesting thing is that this maps upper half of complex plane to upper half of complex plane tau z slightly sim more uh, a z plus b times c bar uh, what do you do c bar z bar plus d bar so this multiplied with the complex conjugate and what do you get here now let me make a simplification here. Just to make life simple, I just use this integers because this is what I am going to be interested in. So, a, b, c, d are going to be integers. So, no c bar, no d bar, ok. So, this comes as a c mod z squared plus b d plus a d z plus b c z bar ok. Now, if you look at the imaginary part of tau z what is that? This is real, this is real. So, this is this is a part that contributes the imaginary part then they take out the real part the imaginary part of z bar is negative of the imaginary part of this. So, the you get a d minus b c times imaginary part of z divided by b z plus d whole square. Now, a d minus b c by the definition is 1. So, this is imaginary part of z divided by So, it is sign is exactly same as image z sign of z ok. So, so that is where I am going to stop because I do not have time, but uh, tomorrow I am going to finish this off. So, this tau is going it is it is a very interesting transformation it looks somewhat funny that you may mapping this in this fashion, but it is a the most general transformation that preserves uh, for example, circles 
circles. If you take a circle and apply tau on it and look at the curve that you get, it will be a circle. If you take line and apply tau on it, what happens to a line? A line also goes to circle. Okay, so circles and lines together go to circles and lines. Okay, so it's basically in general like this. So if you take two lines with a certain angle and look at the corresponding curves under tau, and the the point where they intersect, you look at the corresponding point where the the corresponding tau curves intersect, look at the angle of intersection there, that angle will be present. And this is this is how we can actually characterize this Mobius transformation. That these are the all the class of entire all transformation which preserve this property. So, it is a very interesting subclass of transformation which preserve a lot of properties, and these are going to be useful for us also because the property that we want from this function f of a is essentially invariance under tau. So, f of z or let us say f of tau z, we would want to be roughly equal to f of z, not completely, but roughly.